and welcome to the Information Security Awareness course provided by Canyon Independent School District. It's going to last about an hour to an hour and a half. And when you're done, you can take a quiz that's located at learn.cisd.us. If you make an 80% or above on that quiz, it's going to give you a link to go and download your certificate that you can submit to your authority in your, in your organization. In this course, we're going to focus on best practices and standards to keep you safe, both online and with physical documents. Thanks for taking my course. Let's get started. Information security is a huge thing uh, in the state of Texas right now. Not only are we having to designate a security officer for school districts, but we also have to make sure that every employee is trained and certified that they've gone through a cyber or information security training. And I almost said cybersecurity because last year I actually did this training uh, similar and I called it cybersecurity. But the truth is uh, information security goes far beyond uh, what we do with a computer or digital data. If you look at a definition of information security, it's the measure taken to protect information stored on a computer, computer network, computer system, or physical documents against unauthorized use or access and the measures taken to achieve this. So this includes things like, uh, say, leaving a student's uh, gradebook open on the desk or um, you know, posting grades outside of your classroom. Obviously, with FERPA, we know we're not supposed to do that. But um, um, it could be files on your computer or it could be uh, a physical document that you throw in the trash. Um, this is all sensitive data that hackers use to compromise not only your security, but also the security of your students. And so the first way that we can protect our students is to make sure that you're using good practices in your classroom or in your position with, with any state or local government to, uh, to make sure that the hackers aren't getting past you. Uh, typically with organizations um, such as we have at Canyon ISD, we, uh, we, we spend a lot of money uh, focusing on security and uh, perimeter control, and it, it's very difficult for a hacker to come in directly through the front door. But what they can typically do is come in through you. And when we see districts or, or uh, municipalities that are compromised, this is typically because someone at that organization clicked a file or a link or, or did something that gave the, um, the uh, threat actor a, uh, an opportunity to come in. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what a threat actor is and what that definition refers. But for now, we'll just call it a, a hacker or somebody trying to steal information and to make you less secure. So let's understand our world a little bit. Um, you know, we, we live in a very different world today than we even lived in five years ago. Um, your data is extremely valuable, your data is profitable, and your data is constantly growing. Uh, you, leave a, you leave a footprint everywhere you go when you're online or even in the physical world, and, and you're creating this data pool. And um, the more access that uh, threat actors and hackers and these, these type of people, uh, bad people, the more access they get to this data, the more powerful they, be, they can become in compromising you or, or the, the documents and inf information that you're trying to keep secure. You know, just a couple of things to keep in mind, you know, things like Google Home. And, and let me tell you, I, we, we at Canyon, we're a, we're a Google reference district and, you know, we, uh, we think very highly of the, of the company and what they do for schools. But, you know, there's, there's, there's things like the Google Home that, uh, you know, it, it records your, your information. I mean, uh, you're speaking into it and it's recording it somewhere. Um, how are you controlling the security of that in your home? Or what about iPhones and, and all the mobile devices you carry around? You know, we're, we're all going to carry those things most likely, but but uh, do you know really what it's doing in the background? Um, recently, I hardened my phone and essentially what that means is I took Facebook off, I took Twitter off, um, I took a lot of the apps off that were, were requiring location sharing data. And uh, the reason being is, is ultimately because these, uh, these uh, not just the battery life drain, which by the way, I, I got uh, almost 60% increase in my battery life just by removing this stuff off my Android. But more than that, uh, it's the fact of all the data points these things touch. Um, just an example with your phone, when your phone is on, um, on you and it's doing location sharing, uh, you have an individual identifier that's tied to that phone. And when that phone is then connected to a router or to a cell tower or something else, that cell tower also has unique identification information. And so all of your information is being, being tracked and stored in various databases, whether it's a Facebook database or a Google database, um, 
you know, maybe a Twitter database, maybe it's a governmental data database. Who, who knows where these where this data is going? It's going multiple locations. Um, you know, more than one vested interest has has an interest in your data. Um, and sometimes, you know, with a with a company like Google, they're a, they're a huge company and they have uh, security professionals across the board that make a lot of money, and their sole job is to protect your data on their network. But what about some of these services that you download an app and and maybe they have an IT team of three? Um, do you really know what your phone is doing and where your data is going and what they're collecting? So um, if you're watching Congress and some of the Senate, Senate hearings, this is a big topic. You know, what's happening with the data that's being captured and what's happening with our privacy? Um, same thing with 5G. You'll notice SpaceX just recently launched a, a satellite or a, a, a couple rockets in the air and, and literally launched, I think it was 60 or more satellites uh, around the globe, um, trying to get, again, more coverage. But one of the things that we're going to find is the more coverage you have and the more data points that you have, you know, the less privacy you have as well. So, um, you know, doesn't, regardless of what your concerns on privacy are or, or personal privacy, um, and that's not what this is about. This isn't uh, to be focused on, on that type of thing. What, what we're really focused on is, is these illegitimate groups that want to get that data that you're sending out. Um, but just for... for uh, demonstration sake let me play this video or at least part of it that talks about uh, china's new social credit system so this is just an example probably a pretty extreme example um, of what can go on in the world uh, as data is, is collected so i'm going to play this real quick largest cities, a high-tech high effort is underway to bust low-level low offenders, jaywalkers. Cameras record them going through intersections, zero in on their face, and then publicly shame them on nearby video screens. It's all part of the Chinese government's new social credit system, where people's daily behavior is monitored and rated. I think it's a good thing, this woman said. It makes people more honest. But this social credit rating goes far beyond a traditional credit score, which is based on your finances. China's version factors in everything from jaywalking, to smoking on trains, to buying too many video games. If your score gets too low, you can be banned from buying plane tickets, renting a house, or getting a loan. Nearly 15 million people I'll let you Google the rest of that um, if you want to see more of that video. And obviously, we aren't doing that to that, at least to that degree in the United States. But um, you know, several years ago, we saw what happened with Edward Snowden and and all the uh, information he released. Um, and and so there are tracking things that are that are happening. Um, but you know, it's not just the government doing it. It's it's private enterprise, it's businesses, it's uh, individual app makers that tie stuff into your phone that you you then allow um, to track you. So um, just be leery of this stuff because the, the hackers love it. The more data they can get, the better off uh, they are as, as far as stealing your information. So how do we protect ourselves? Because we are globalizing. The, the world is becoming more and more um, uh, global and, and data driven. So um, some things that we can do to, to ultimately protect ourselves is we can make sure that we have a malware and antivirus solution installed on all our machines. So obviously uh, your IT director or um, whoever runs the IT for your organization uh, should be doing that. Um, but uh, it's also on your personal home machines. Uh, make sure you have an antivirus at home because if you have a machine, say a laptop at home, and you get a virus and you bring that into your organization, uh, connect to the network, then you could potentially infect your entire organization's network. So um, that's a, that can be a very big concern, especially in an organization like Canyons where we do a, a BYOD device. So um, while we give our employees and give our students devices, we also allow you to bring devices in. Well, we also allow you to bring everything that you are that you have on your device in. So we have to set things in motion to protect that. But it's better if you also are doing things in, uh, to protect yourself. Um, we're going to talk about free internet here in a minute too. But be you got to be concerned about free internet. Uh, in fact, I, I hate free internet at Starbucks and McDonald's and all these places. Um, those companies aren't doing anything necessarily wrong, but it's the people that connect to those internet networks that that can be very very dangerous for you. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. 
Bluetooth and auto connect probably should always be off. Um, when you're talking about a, a fo your phone is on Bluetooth, there are certain types of exploits that hackers can do just with a Bluetooth connection. And they can get into your phone if, if there's certain things aren't up to date, they could potentially steal your information directly off your phone without you ever knowing they did it. So um, we kind of have to have a security mindset on, on things we do. And um, you know, the, there's a convenience factor and there's a um, uh, there's a danger factor and you sometimes you have to sacrifice uh, a little bit of convenience to reduce the danger so um, PII security and procedure so we have to be very aware of personal identifying information uh, here at Canyon we tell our employees that um, if you're gonna send information to another person inside or outside the district it's very important that we uh, we use as minimal uh, of personal identifying information as possible and so here's an example of that if you send a student uh, an email to another staff member and it's got a student's name you know typically pretty harmless but then when you add the the birthday into that um, we now have two identifying factors of that student. Uh, maybe you add a third one, like maybe their address. So now you have a name, an address, and their birthday. So what happens if your email is compromised or possibly their email, which you have no control of, is, is compromised? Um, now the, the, uh, the threat actor is going to come in. Um, if it was me, I would, I would do everything I could once I get access to your email and I'm going to offload that as quickly as possible to another machine. So I'm going to dump, you know, 100,000, 200,000 emails, whatever I can do to get that uh, copied out of your system and get in and out without without you ever knowing I was there. Um, that That's really the, the would be the goal for me because then now I can spend my time combing through your stuff, finding all that personal identifiable information. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a database of that information and then I'm going to continue trying to exploit. And we watch these movies of uh, hackers at CSI and all this, and and you get uh, this hacker that jumps on a computer and they, they just hit a couple of keystrokes and all of a sudden they're in the NSA servers or something. But um, hacking truly is not like that. Um, there are definitely scripts and powerful things that people can use to compromise systems, but typically hacking is uh, could be up to six months or even years of, of information gathering. You know, finding as much information out as you can before you run your exploit. So there, there's even a chance that right now um, you're being exploited and you don't even know it because um, they're just packaging information of, of, of who you are, what you do, um, mother's maiden name, address, all that kind of information. So the, the less ability we give people to have this information, the better off we are. Now, uh, some of you might be saying, well, I have to send uh, names and addresses and phone numbers, and sometimes I have to send social security numbers, and, and that's fine. You do have to do that sometimes, but we have better ways of doing that. So we want to use encryption and secure sending, and whenever possible, walk it across the hall, you know, it, you know if, that, if that is a possibility for you. But we want to be very careful with the way we handle the data and the way we transmit it, um, because especially after you send it, you may not have control over it. Um, data classifications and procedures. You know, this is uh, this is more for administrative uh, standpoint and really more for school districts. But the, um, you know, we have data classifications and there's some data we we want the public to see. Um, this video right here is a is a public data. We want our public to see this. We want other teachers to see this. But the uh, the concern is when uh, we have something more private. Well, maybe we have an internal communication only. Um, or maybe we have a confidential or restricted. And we're going to talk about the different classifications a little bit further. So, you know, we have restricted. Uh, most people think confidential is the highest level, but really it's restricted. This is stuff you don't share with anybody. And typically it's, uh, it's stuff you have uh, specific access to for your job purpose and and nobody can see that so um, you don't talk about it with friends you don't share that information you know things like uh, you know HIPAA type of stuff or, or health records you know you you may be privy to information uh, about a student or another staff member that um, it would be an absolute violation not only of uh, the organization's policy but even law for you to share that information with somebody else so these are restricted things um, we have confidential and these are things you only share with people who need to get, need it to get their job done so um, maybe uh, me and you have something that we've got to we've got to communicate um, we have a legal way of communicating that and we're gonna do that but um, it's, it's just between us. It's a confidential thing. It's labeled as confidential. And, and once we receive it, we, we, have, we have the proper methods of handling it. 
Uh, agency internal means that they, hey, we're gonna we're gonna send that email throughout the agent agency, but it's not to go to the public. Those these are these are things that are internal to our organization, and of course, public. We we want people to see. Uh, we don't care if it's if it's public knowledge. So. Um, you know, data comes in a lot of forms. Uh, it comes in a file, Word document, Google Doc, photos, communications. Um, can be a physical piece of paper. You know, a lot of people forget about that paper, and that you know they throw it away or they leave it on their desk. Um, even something as, as simple as leaving your password underneath your keyboard. Um, these are all uh, areas of data that we, we need to be concerned about and protecting it. Um, you know, sometimes we get complacent about students to think, oh, well, they, they won't think to look under my keyboard. Well, what if they do? And they, and they get your password, and then now you never know that they have password, a password to your computer. So um, we got to be aware of that kind of stuff. So where, where is data located? Um, this is all the stuff that's on our quiz, so you might want to, uh, especially if it's in red, and I might specify red items as we go along if I forget to, forgot to mark it in red, but, you know, data can be on local media or local hard drives, a USB drive or an external hard drive. Uh, you might find that in attachments or in the physical email itself. You might find it in uh, file cabinets, desk drawers, or top of the desk. Um, and then a lot of times we, we put it in the cloud or in backup systems. Um, we're a big cloud district, so we, we store a lot of things in Google Cloud, but we also have restrictions and we have monitoring tools to, to really examine what's happening in Google Cloud and um, or Google Drive as it's called. Um, and make sure that uh, you know we have a good data loss prevention uh, structure there, so that you know data is being shared appropriately and with the right people. Um, you got to be very, very careful what you put in the cloud. In fact, we tell people here at Canyon ISD, don't stick uh, social security numbers or, pers or or extreme personal identifying information in Google Drive at all. Keep that on a on an internal system in, of, of some shape or form. Or if it has to be on Google Drive, then we're going to have a method of encrypting that, so that even if some a hacker gets access to your Google Drive directly, they won't have the password to decrypt the files on your Google Cloud. So if your organization doesn't have an encryption tool for your cloud environment, then I would say you want to you kind of want to stay away from putting sensitive files on there. So let's talk about accessibility. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, when I do this training live, um, I tend to actually have a Wi-Fi pineapple uh, sitting in my uh, uh, training area. And so let's talk about what Wi-Fi pineapples do. Um, it's very important, especially if you're in a public place and you're dealing with student data or sensitive data. So a Wi-Fi pineapple is a little, it's basically called a, a honeypot of a sort. And it's a, a way of attracting people uh, to connect to a Wi-Fi device that doesn't belong to the organization that's providing internet. So if I was to walk into Starbucks with my Wi-Fi pineapple, I would set it up. I'd make it look exactly like the Starbucks uh, network. And then when people come into Starbucks, they would connect and they would connect to me uh, instead of Starbucks. And so they think all along they're connecting to the, the public internet that the Starbucks is providing. And in reality, they probably are, but they're going through me first. And so what I can do with this is I can, uh, without getting really technical, I can steal your password information. I can steal. I can see where you go. Um, it's a great tool for a hacker to go in and just find anything out about a person. Um, you would be shocked to know what you can find about someone's internet search habits because they're sitting at Starbucks for an hour, you know, going to the Facebook and bank accounts and doing internet searches and all along this hacker sitting in the background uh, just cataloging it and getting information. And sometimes maybe rerouting you to something that looks like a Facebook page. Uh, so you go to Facebook.com and you actually legitimately type Facebook.com. And because you're going through the hacker's network, you instead of going to Facebook, you get routed to his uh, uh, or hers, either one, uh, Facebook lookalike page because he's controlling the traffic. And so when you type in your username and password, the hacker is going to let you go to Facebook and let you get in, but not before he captures your username and password. And now he's into your Facebook account or he could be in your email account, maybe even your bank account. So the Wi-Fi security is null on these free public Wi-Fi's and I would highly recommend you don't connect to them. Um, if you have to connect to them, use what's called a VPN and you want to use a trusted VPN. It's a virtual private network. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about trusted VPNs and definitely not going to give formal recommendations, but in the book, the ebook at learn.cisd.us, I do give a couple VPNs that I've used. Um, keep in mind that these are VPNs that you would have to trust. Um, don't take my recommendation for it. This stuff you need to research yourself. Um, but yeah, stay away from public Wi Fi because they can be dangerous. 
What about public access? So you go to a library, you pop on a computer, you check your email and you, and you slip away. Well, be careful with that because when you log into a public computer, number one, you don't know what's been installed on that computer. You don't know if there's a key logger or other software trying to grab your information. But on top of that, many, many people, you'd be surprised how many times I've logged onto a public computer, went to Gmail and noticed that somebody else was already logged in because they didn't log out or they didn't use a private or incognito window. And so when they do that, you've just given somebody complete reign over your account. And think of all the things that you do that um, require a password reset through an email. So once I have access to your email, not only am I searching for personal identifying information and things that would compromise you as a person, but I'm also um, looking for things, that, looking for other accounts you have access to so that I can compromise those accounts because the more access I have, the more I can steal until I, I have so much information that I can, I can finally start my attack, right? Uh, personal storage, we kind of mentioned this a minute ago, but just be careful where you store stuff, um, especially like on your computer. You know, you save something to your C drive or to a flash drive. You can recover that information anytime, even if it's been deleted or formatted. Um, just a good example, uh, several years back, I was doing uh, computer hardware or computer maintenance uh, on the side. And I had a company come to me and he wanted they wanted to uh, fix a virus on their machine. Well, this virus was so bad, I had to erase the computer entirely. I'm talking remove Windows, format the drive, and I had to do that like three times to actually get the thing to start responding. So I finally got Windows back and reinstalled and got all those apps put back on. It's now a completely clean slate. And then I have this little piece of hardware um, and I ran that against the uh, the hard drive and I pulled all his pictures back. I didn't I didn't just pull his pictures um, and there, there, there were many of those. I pulled back every picture of every website he'd ever searched. And so I'll, I'll let your mind be creative, your mind be creative there, but that's kind of scary. So any website he ever went to, I know how to copy of the pictures that were on the, those websites. So um, what's even more scary is that these tools I'm talking about on this page, the pineapple and the scanning tool, we're talking about $100 or less. And anybody can buy them, they're, they're readily available, and some of them are even free. So um, it's not like it's a, it's a you know, $5,000 tool you have to buy to, to be able to hack people. Really for about 500 bucks, you can have an incredible arsenal um, to, to compromise people's data and personal security. So. So let's talk about the cloud a little bit. What is it, and uh, and, and what was it doing, and, and what kind of security do we can we expect? So uh, first of all, what is it? Um, all the cloud is it's another computer. So you're connected. So think of it as if you have two computers, uh, your computer and somebody else's, and you're storing your files on somebody else's computer, and you have a special access. So it's a it's a little bit more intensive than that. We're talking about things like AWS and Dropbox and Google. Uh, these companies, again, they are they are huge companies, and they can forward um, very focused security efforts. So they do, they they make a lot of uh, consorted efforts to protect your data while they're on those systems. Um, and and again, you a hacker is probably not going to go directly at, at Google and try to compromise Google servers to get at everybody who has a Google account, right? It it just would be very intensive. You're talking about um, a lot it'd be a lot of money to do that as well so but what's very very easy is to find people with google accounts and compromise them so when i can compromise you or i can get your password or i can i can do something to get into your account then i don't have to attack google i can attack you and you're much easier to attack than google is so um so keep keep that in mind uh, privacy, you know, everybody has a privacy policy. If they don't have a privacy policy, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as far as creating accounts on websites, but also just as far as storage. Um, Google, Microsoft, uh, Dropbox, AWS, they're all going to have a privacy policy. And, you know, they're not fun to read, but I recommend you read them and find out what exactly uh, is private in your account and what who has access to what. Um, is it encrypted? Um, do they wor use words like AES-256? That's that's the modern standard of encryption. Um, you you want to know this type of stuff to know how safe your, your data is when you're putting it on somebody else's computer. Um, sharing. One of the big things we see with sharing is that can be very dangerous is that some of these services, um, I'm going to reference Google because we're a Google district, so we, we deal with this a lot. Um, sharing can be dangerous in the sense that uh, I'm going to stick something in my Google Drive, I'm going to click share, and then I'm just going to copy the link and then email it to somebody. What people often don't realize is that when they've done that, they've now shared it with everybody. 
um, it's now a it's now an, a, an open link that people can can get access to if they search or if they have direct access to the link. So um, just because I copied the link and sent it to one person doesn't mean that other people now won't have access to that. So when we share, we want to be very targeted of how we share. So rather than clicking the sharing button, we need to click the thing with share with, and we need to specify the email addresses or groups that we want to share with, um, share those files with. So um, make sure when you click share in any of these services that you know exactly who it's being shared with. And nor normally it'll tell you. It'll say right there, this uh, this file is being shared with everybody at Canyon ISD or anybody at Canyon ISD can view this file. Um, if you see that, that means that all staff, all students could essentially find that file through a search or other method uh, if they needed to. Well, what happens if we're, if we're um, if we're sharing something that's uh, like a discipline record or something well now another student might see that discipline record or a health record or something like that so we we got to be very very targeted and set some good policy on how we we share and then make sure people understand that process uh, we've talked pretty much in depth about security in the cloud um, but again i'll reiterate you know it's better not to store anything that uh, that you have uh, a security concern uh, on those systems it's not really not what they're intended for and they it can be dangerous to have them out there so i'd, I'd avoid that <clears throat> So information awareness, um, this is a couple quick ones, but it's always good to learn. So don't think to just, just because you came to this training and you listened to me speak for an hour that you now have all the knowledge you need to, to go forward in security. Um, the, the thing is that the, the, the front of, of information security changes on a daily basis. And it's always good to, to be aware of the most common threats, what's happening in the world, and, uh, and how things are changing. Because today, this, is the, this Apple phone is more secure, but tomorrow maybe it's not. You know, and I'm using Apple just as another example to get away from Google. So the, there's always um, something out there that can be compromised or something that that you maybe should know about as a consumer or as an employee to protect your data. Um, let's talk briefly about free and open source. You know, there, there's a lot of free things out there, and, and I'm a big advocate of open source tools and, and some of the free stuff, but you got to be very, very careful. Um, we've uh, we found in some, some situations here at Canyon where someone had downloaded a an extension. This is an extension inside of the Google App Store, just wasn't caught, and uh, and what it did is it rerouted every time they click a PDF inside of their Google Drive, it would reroute them to their uh, website and that had nothing to do with the PDF or Canon ISD. Um, really, it was it was farming their information. So um, we uh, we of course blocked that, and we've moved to a standard where we are we are actually uh, not allowing users to install apps. Uh, we find we have a list of whitelisted apps that we we've approved, we've tested, and we've verified are safe, and then we let our, our staff install those. Um, but be very very careful what you install because once you install it, then you're at the mercy of who created it. So be very careful of that. So how to react? Um, you know, if you're compromised or you or you have a, a situation happen. Um, don't ignore it. That's the most important thing on this slide. Just don't you ha you want to let your supervisor know. You want to let your IT department know. And here's the thing: if you don't let them know quickly, um, then you could run the risk of being compromised even further. Uh, another step, and this is something you're going to have to lean on your IT department for. But if uh, let's say you get a warning that pops up, warning, warning, you've been compromised, and there's, there's alarms going off, and all kinds of weird things, or maybe your files uh, you can't open any of them anymore. You, you have a form of ransomware. Um, the the first thing you want to do is you want to find that data cable in the pack your computer. And again, this you might lean on your security team for this. Do that? Do they want you to do this? Don't just make this assumption because you heard me speak about it. But um, find the data cable, plug it into the wall, and remove it from the wall. Unplug that uh, because what happens then is that that's going to keep that virus on your computer and keep it from going out to somebody else's computer because that's what they like to do. They like to propagate. Um, don't shut down your machine. Don't log off. Don't do anything. Don't click anything. Um, when you get these errors, it's better to notify one of the professionals who deal with it. So in your IT department or whoever, and say, hey, uh, this warning came up. It's telling me to do this. What do you want me to do? And typically, we'll remote in. We'll take a look at it. And then we will we will solve the problem from there or we'll actually physically come on site. But um, don't ever click the close button. Don't ever click the cancel or OK um, because these things are meant to trick you and, and make you actually physically interact with the program, which could actually give you the virus. 
Um, be weary of websites or emails or files that look unusual or kind of leery. Misspellings, um, out of the norm from what a person would normally send you. Um, you want to you wanna be really leery of those things. And if, if concerned, again, reach out to somebody else and say, hey, this looks weird. What do you want me to do about it? Um, <clears throat> Uh, and again, never hide or, or ignore a security event. Um, it's it's better to let people know and protect everyone else than to hide it and that thing keeps growing and becoming a bigger and bigger problem. The, the bigger these things get, sometimes the harder they are to fight. So let's talk about communications. So email is a big one. So this is a lot of ways that people get compromised is through email. Um, specifically spoofing, phishing, uh, and, and other kind of fraudulent email accounts. So a, a phishing is, uh, campaign is when someone sends you an email and tries to um, pretend that they're somebody else. So maybe they're pretending they're my superintendent or maybe they're pretending they're Facebook or um, UPS, you know, who knows? There's a lot of ways they try to trick you. And uh, uh, it's important we never respond to these emails. Don't ever click anything inside the email. Don't ever download the attachments. Um, you may not realize it's fake until you open it, but once you open it and you realize there's something off here. Uh, a common one is, uh, uh, hey, we've, uh, hey, finance department person, uh, I need to change my direct deposit. Uh, can you let me know how we, pro can, can we process that today or whatever the case may be? Another popular one is uh, superintendent or somebody in authority comes down and says, hey, we want to do something fun for our staff. Do you mind running out and grabbing uh, $100 in gift cards and then just send me the, the gift card codes and then I'll reimburse you. Um, these are just common things that we see and what happens is they're just trying to get, get you compromised so they can get your money or get your data. So you want to, want to avoid that. Uh, the spoofing side of the phishing is that where they're impersonating something. Uh, the phishing is where they're trying to get you to interact or get you uh, to receive an email where you do something thinking that you're doing something else. It's a, it's a, a deception, essentially. So, um, <clears throat> you know, another thing with emails is, is authentication. We want to make sure that we are, are, are safe in the way we access our email. One of the best ways to do that is having a strong password. Now, I think I would say that's the number one way. You never want to use, you know, your uh, dictionary word or something that is, uh, uh, I can I, I can easily guess, you know, things with your family, things with your town, your, your school. Uh, they're just not safe at all. Um, I've seen so many bad passwords, people that use their last name and then an at sign, an exclamation point, and four numbers. That is a super easy password to break. Um, you you got to consider that these people that hack uh, machines, um, and hack passwords, they're using what we call brute force attacks and they have databases with millions and millions of passwords. And so they're going to hammer your account with those passwords until they find one that matches and they're going to use every variation in the book that they can, the, that the, the system can think of. So these are very logical systems and so you want to separate that from, from you. You don't want them to be able to, to engineer or do what we call social engineering to, uh, to, to kind of trick you into giving them information that could ultimately make you give them your password uh, without you even knowing it. So uh, another way is two-factor authentication, you know, whether it's using Google Authenticator or um, there's, other, there's other types of two-factor authentication like um, uh, cell phone authentication or certain key fobs you can do. But I would recommend everybody listening to this to set up dual-factor authentication on everything that allows it. Um, because even the most basic form in the form of a cell phone, which is not the most secure, but is way more secure than what you're doing today, uh, the, the, the hacker would have to get access to your cell phone or compromise your cell phone in some way in order to get into your account. So it, it's going to put a, a barrier above and beyond what you're doing today. So you want to, again, strong passwords, dual authentication, and never give your password to anybody. So. So what is phishing? Um, we're going to watch this briefly, not a, not a long video, but I'm going to watch just a big old part of it and then y'all can obviously watch the rest of it on YouTube. While checking your email, you receive an alarming message from your bank. It says that your account might be jeopardized and provides a link to enter in your private information. Even though the logos and contact information appear to be correct, this email wasn't from your bank, but instead it was sent by cyber criminals looking to fish issue. Phishing is when scammers trick you into divulging personal and financial information by pretending to be a legitimate source. Just like fishermen cast lines and beta these scammers send out official sounding emails, hoping that you will let your guard down. 
They often build entire pages and logins dedicated to looking like authentic banks or businesses, designed to get you to gain your trust or your guard. Even more alarming, Fishers can even pose as your friends and family to trick you. In some cases, a phishing email can install malware on your computer without you even entering your username and password. Regardless of how they obtain it, once cyber criminals have your login information, they can change your password, steal your money, and even your identity. There are many ways to identify a possible phishing email. No legitimate bank, government agency, or business would send you an email requesting that you re-enter your private information. Misspellings, poor grammar, and typos are also good indicators of a phishing email. If you receive a phishing email, the best thing to do is just ignore it and mark it as spam. You can also use anti-spam filters as a way to avoid these emails. Okay, and so you can find that uh uh, on uh, YouTube. Uh, I think it's Kapersky actually put that one out. So if you're a government agency, you can't actually use Kapersky via, uh, through a new government regulation, but Kapersky did put this video out. And it's a really good video on how to uh, identify and avoid spam. So, or filter, or not spam, uh, phishing. Okay, so um, here's an example of phishing email. So this is one I actually built. So I built a phishing tool and um, uh, so just to show how simple that is to do uh, and then I fished a Hotmail account that I created and so um, you notice this email looks like it came from alert at facebook.com uh, it went to my test account at hotmail.com and then um, it just wants the user to reset their password and so if I was to click on any of these links it would even the unsubscribe link uh, it would uh, it, it has potential to compromise my account so um, some things to look at here, there's you know, probably some misspellings. It's not really structured the way Facebook would do it, um, which, so you want to be aware of that. But also, and I can't do that here, but if I was to put my mouse over this A here and I was to click it, it would show that the email did not actually originate from Facebook.com. Um, it is a fake email that came outside of Facebook system, had nothing to do with Facebook. So you want to be aware of that kind of stuff. And besides that, Facebook will never send you a notice that says, we've noticed unusual activity. Please reset your account. Um, typically, if you if you receive this and you think it might be legitimate, your best bet is to delete the, delete the email, go to Facebook.com, and actually reset your password there. So don't ever do it through an email, um, even if it seems like it might be legit. So let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide here. So th these are some examples of what we call clickbait. So the same type of concept, only this is actually online. So you get these pop-ups that are trying to entice you to click on something, right? And so um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these while you've been searching Google or you know different websites, and all of a sudden this clickbait pops up and says, hey, uh, uh, whether it's an attention or whether it's some kind of a, uh, looks like a news heading type of thing over here or something, and it wants you to click into it so that you're on their website and then of course you're on their terms. Um, when you click these things, you are opening your, chance, your chances up to, be, to being infected by malware significantly. So um, just a good example, um, I, I did a hacking course several years ago, and uh, this was a, a white, hack, white hat hacking course, so it's a, it's a legal hacking course to find out what hackers do and how to prevent them. So one of the things I did um, is I created a website, and in this website, I, I built it and, uh, so that if someone came to that, that site that was running Windows 7 and Internet Explorer 8, that the moment they hit that website, I would get remote access control to their computer. Um, at the time, Windows 7 was outdated. Windows or my, uh, Internet Explorer 9 was also outdated. I think we were on 10 or 11 at that point. But it shows that that if you don't keep your stuff updated and you click on some of these links, the user didn't have to do anything. They just had to go to my website. And once they went there, um, on my computer sitting in my office, I could uh, I could see everything they were doing, and I had actual admin control over that machine. Uh, keep in mind, this was all done in a lab. I didn't do it in a in an environment that would compromise anybody, so uh, I wasn't breaking any laws uh, for anybody concerned. But uh, I was doing a proof of concept, and it worked flawlessly, repeatedly. And uh, in fact, somewhere on YouTube, I, I posted the video of how it works, and it, it's it's actually shocking. Um, 
So avoid clicking this type of stuff. And, and this is the type of things where like, if I was to click this X right here, I would probably get the virus. Uh, remind me later, I'd probably get the virus. Anything I click, sometimes even mousing over it will give you uh, a, a compromise. So that's why you just leave it alone and let somebody uh, in IT take care of it. So let's talk about encryption briefly. So why do we encrypt and when do we encrypt and the types of encryption? So I'm not gonna go deep into encryption, just know that we need to be doing it. Um, if you're in a store, a sense of data over a long period of time, it's better to encrypt it. And so I can't tell you how to do that because obviously that's gonna be something your organization sets forth and software that they have. Um, first and foremost, if you have a laptop, you need to be encrypting your laptops. Um, if you lose that laptop, I don't care what, if your password's a 300 character long password, I can about, in about 20 seconds, I can get into your hard drive and I can steal everything off your hard drive if it's not encrypted. So um, encrypting your hard drive makes it impossible for me to do that. So um, if you, if you don't know if your if your hard drive is encrypted, talk to your IT staff and ask them. Uh, they would they would know. And if they don't know, then it's not encrypted. So um, that's the definitely one, one step. Things on Google Cloud. You know, we have a tool. Uh, we use I believe SysCloud, and I'm not I'm not endorsing or or not endorsing them. Uh, but we, that's who we use, and uh, we're able to, to encrypt files on our Google Drive using that product. Um, but there's a lot of products out there that allow you to encrypt files and you got to figure out what's best for you. Uh, just know that it's, when it's encrypted, you don't have access to it. You have to click it and type a password, decrypt the file, and then, then you can have access to it. The same thing goes with emails. Um, when we send an email, we send them through a, a Google Drive or a Google email, or we use it to send it through Office 365. Both options have an encryption tool. Um, we prefer Gmail uh, for our most secure encryption because its level of encryption is such that the only the person who it was sent to can open it and they can't print it, copy it, or, or in any other way um, get that information out of that email. And plus it deletes itself after whatever specified number of days we send. Um, but there are times when we have to send files or we have to send stuff that needs to be copied. And when we need to do that, we use Office 365 and we send a special email, uh, that's only for special emails that, that need that type of uh, access. And it uses uh, encryption in that system to basically set, uh, encrypt it, send it, and then when you receive that email, you have to decrypt it. Um, you don't have to do much, you just click it and then it decrypts. Uh, and once it decrypts, it's it's open. So um, our, our kind of protocol for that is that when you receive an encrypted email, so from me, it would be at secure.canonisd.net. So when you receive a secure email, um, you need to get the files, uh, do what you need to do with them, and then you need to del delete that email so that data is gone. Because once you open the file, it's decrypted, and then therefore if your account's ever compromised, then that data is also compromised. Uh, just one more note on encryption. Um, there are flash drives that have built-in hardware encryption. I think Iron Key is one of those. Um, we've looked at that for our administrative staff as, a, as an option where basically you, you plug in the flash drive and you type a password. And these things are so secure that if you type the password in wrong, like I think it's five times, uh, it, it scraps the entire drive. It becomes literally a, a brick. You can't do anything with it. You can't physically tamper with it. So th these, are, these are for really secure files. As long as you remember the password or you keep it in a vault somewhere, don't keep it under your desk or, or hidden in your office or on a computer anywhere. But as long as you have access to that password, you can access those files. And if you don't have that password, th those files are pretty secure. So just another option. Um, FERPA, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on FERPA. We should all know what that is. We have state required courses to take this, but uh, uh, we just need to make sure that the, the data practices we are doing are not violating FERPA. Kind of like that sharing thing. We have information uh, that we have on a student and... Um, if we're sharing that inappropriately or we're not being careful of how we're sharing it, then we're essentially violating the FERPA law. So uh, be very careful with what you're doing there. If you don't understand FERPA or you don't understand how to protect student data or what can be shared and what can't be, then um, you know definitely talk to your administrator. This, this course isn't on FERPA, but uh, you need to be aware of that because your sharing practices directly affect that. So let's talk about your digital footprint. Um, you know, everywhere you go, you leave a footprint. You know, we talk about this building of data, but um, whether you're on a security camera somewhere or whether you're, your phone is transmitting to 50 different services because of location data, you are leaving a digital profile. And the bigger your footprint, the more likely you are to be hacked. Um, you know, some, some things that we do, that I do is, uh, 
you know, like I said, I've removed all these apps off my phone. I've, I've told the my phone specifically, I have a, I have a Pixel, so it, it depends on your phone if it has this capability. Um, I've told it don't allow location services unless the app is in use. And so my phone is never running location services unless that app is physically on and on the screen. Um, some other ways that you can reduce uh, some social profiles, uh, locking your credit score. Uh, you know, uh, we I, I lock all three of my credit bureaus. Um, uh, you can either lock it or you can do a credit freeze. Either one is good. One is better than the other. But, um, you know, it's just one of those things you can lock that pr- footprint. So if someone does get your information, they have a less likely chance of compromising you personally. Um, you know, what you do doesn't uh, doesn't really go away. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute of just some pictures online that, uh, you know, might affect someone's ability to get a job in the future. You know, it might ab- affect somebody's ability to to win that deal or whatever the case may be. Or uh, worst case scenario, as, as educators, you know, we don't want our students seeing things online that would uh, make them question our character or, or who we are as um, as leaders or as authorities. So uh, be, be aware of that. Be aware of social engineering. It's a big problem, and you don't really know what's happening when it's happening. So, uh, social engineering is basically when when a fraudulent person is trying to trick you into divulging information. You know, sometimes this can be because your mom's Facebook account was compromised, and now you get a text uh, or a Facebook message from your mom and says, "Hey, just want to see how you're doing," and then they start a conversation. Well, you think you're talking to your parent uh, when you're really talking to the hacker who's compromised your parent's account. Um, so. Uh, this happens all the time, and and again, you know, we, we think of hackers as you know destroying our systems, and, and it does happen. Um, we hear about ransomware all the time, and all these things. Uh, that's for a specific purpose. But a really good hacker, um, they're going to be in your system and doing things well before you ever get the ransomware, because they want to they want to get as much information without you knowing they're getting information. So. Um, you might have a whole conversation with a family member and not really be the family member. So <laughs> want to be careful with that. Um, be careful who you accept friends on Facebook. Um, I, you know, as a rule of thumb, I never accept a, a friend sh- a friend request from a student. Um, I don't think any educator should. But um, on top of that, um, and, and in fact, I, even after they graduated, I, I don't do that for for many years. Maybe way down the road, I would do that, but not not any time close to education. And there's multiple reasons for that. But um, on top of that, um, you know. Someone, I can go to, if I know who you are and I've Googled you enough, I can find a picture and I can create a Facebook account that looks like you, has your information just like your, your real Facebook account does, and then all of a sudden I, uh, I'm, I'm giving you a friend request. Well, you think I'm the person requesting uh, access. Um, we, last time we did this, did this training live, uh, we had a, a, a community member stand up and said that, yeah, they received a, uh, 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 I think it was a Facebook fed request from a relative that had been deceased for a year or two. So, um, you know, this is this is dangerous stuff. It had their picture. It had their information. I mean, it was a very well done, I think, you know, um, profile, but it wasn't the person that was, that was sending the request. So be very careful of people trying to social engineer you. Um, think about phone calls. You get a phone call from somebody and uh, maybe they just want to send you a white paper. They want to just get a little information about your network or they want to get a little information about how you do school. Um, be very leery of these things because these people are trying to get information. And and again, information is gold. So the more information they can get, the more databases they can build on you and the more you can be compromised. So um, be very guarded with your information. That's I think that's a key thing you need to remember out of this whole presentation. Uh, your online activity, what happens online stays online. Um, you are a brand. And and uh, like I said, if nothing else, you're, you're representing your community. You're representing your student if you're, if you're in education. Um, and, and you want to have that rapport. And th- one wrong decision online can destroy that rapport. So you want to be very, very careful of that. Actively monitor your, your, your social media. Google yourself. You know, a lot of people say, don't Google yourself. Well, I think don't Google yourself if you're a celebrity because then you, get, you just get depressed. But if you are, uh, um, if you're the average person, Google yourself. You need to know what's out there. You need to know what you've put out there accidentally, but you also need to know what other people have put out there on your behalf. Um, this is a problem not only for y'all, but also for students. You know, what what are students posting about other students? Uh, this is probably the, one of the biggest problems of our age, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, security and privacy. Um, 
So some best practice for securing your and storing your information. Um, store paper forms securely in locked filing, cab filing cabinets. Don't keep them on your desk. Um, you know, don't give them places where people can access them. And definitely don't keep your password. Um, not only don't keep them on your desk, but don't store them in a file on your computer. That's uh, Hackers love that kind of stuff because when, once they get access to your computer, they have all your passwords. So um, it, they need to be someplace safe, secure, and locked up. And ideally, memorize them. Um, I use a program called LastPass. There's also a program called OnePassword, just so I'm not advertising one product over another. Uh, KeyPass is another one. There, there's plenty of them out there. So um, these things uh, hold your uh, your um, uh, passwords and some notes, and they encrypt it with that AES-256 standard. So uh, makes it very, very hard for hackers to steal that data unless they get your original password. So what I do is I make an extremely difficult uh, master password and I store all my passwords in, in LastPass and it, it helps me to stay secure so that I can, I, I, I don't have to remember 50 passwords, but I can also have unique passwords for every service I have. And those passwords are not personally identifiable. They have unique characters. Maybe they're phrase driven. They're, they're, they're very difficult passwords for anybody to actually come up with. Um, obviously, use secure storage media, stuff that's encrypted. And if, you're, if it's not encrypted, keep it in a secure place. And when you're not using it, you need to destroy that. Um, I'm not sure if we covered it yet. It should have been covered unless I skipped it. But what do we do with data? Um, let's see if I... Oh, no, that's the next slide. So what do we do with data? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, let's see. Restrict. We talked about sharing and all that kind of stuff. Um, Keep groups up to date. You know, if you have email groups, you know, in the Canyon, we let you create an email group for your teams or whatever. Make sure that those email groups are up to date and you don't have people in those groups that aren't supposed to be. Um, that's always very important. Uh, locking screensavers or just doing the Windows L when you walk away from the computer. You'd be surprised. And if, you, if Canyon ISD is listening, uh, when you walk away from a computer, just hit, just hit Windows L and lock that screen. I know it's an inconvenience to come back to that machine and log back in, but when you leave your machine unlocked, you are leaving it unlocked for any student or even another staff member. And we trust our staff members, but at the same time, you are protecting information. And so it's important that you protect that information so that people can't get access to it. Um, and then secure file transfer, just like we talked about in um, uh, the encryption tools. So if the worst case scenario, put it on a flash drive and physically walk it over to somebody or put it in inner office mail or something. Okay, so when you are uh, dealing with information on flash drives, you have options. You can clear it, you can purge it, or you can destroy it. So if you clear something, that's the weakest form of security. So I have a little graph here um, made by Stellar. Um, pretty good graph on what, what to do and how to, how to handle information. So I'll let you read this, but to, to kind of uh, make it simple, uh, clearing data removes the data, but um, it can't be recovered through normal system functions. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not like putting it in the trash can. We can't, uh, we can't just go to the trash can and recover it, right? Um, but there are ways that a, a, a hacker can easily pull that data out, just like that computer um, situation I spoke about earlier. There's purge, which uh, removal of the data using technology that makes it impossible to recover um, using known methods. So, so purging it is using a special technology tool to actually, um, actually kind of scrape the drive or zero the drive out. It makes it very, very difficult, if not semi impossible. I, I hate the word impossible when it comes to technology, but to get the data back using these special tools. But uh, in certain situations, you just want to destroy it. And so if I'm using a piece of data or a piece of flash drive or something, and I've got secure or restricted data on this on this flash drive, when I'm done with it and I'm never going to use it again or um, for, for, for a secure purpose, then I know it costs money, but physically destroy it. Um, Degauss it or smash it with a hammer. Make sure that thing doesn't exist anymore. Um, so the times we want to purge it is really just when we're trying to use it for a for a uh, uh, another task, and we need to we need to slice the hard drive up and and make sure it's not recoverable. So, um, but uh, by by all means, the best the best thing you can do is destroy the hard drive and make sure that's it because that's the only way that you can kind of semi guarantee that it won't be uh, possible to be recovered. <clears throat> We've talked about passwords briefly, so I'm not going to go in depth on this one. You, uh, using passphrases is good. Uh, go into my ebook and go to the passwords section, and you're going to see kind of some examples of some, of some passwords that are good to use. You want to make them very complex. You want to make them long. Avoid saving them anywhere and don't hide them. Hiding them is not effective uh, for anybody. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go into depth of this. We've talked about passwords, and it's in the book, so you can you guys can read that. So threat actors, what is a th threat actor? They, they are um, individuals that, that basically are hackers or people that want to attack and steal our data. So um, uh, the risks are really everywhere. Uh, it could be your neighbor. It could be a student. It could be a staff member. Um, threat actors are not the guy in the hoodie sitting behind uh, a computer in a dark room, you know, surfing the dark web all day. Um, they might do some of that, but the the thing is, a threat actor is anybody who wants to steal your information. Um, think about the student who has no technical skill in your classroom, and that student can be a threat actor even having no computer skill because that student wants to get another student's grades or they want to get the answers to the to a state test i don't know who knows what they wanted to get but just the fact that they want it makes them a threat actor because now they're going to go try to get it they're going to look at your desk they're going to look under your keyboard they're going to do what they can try to do to uh, look over your shoulder even um, uh, and that requires no technical skill so just be aware that we're not talking about hackers here. We're talking about uh, threat actors is the word because it's, it's, it's hackers and people trying to steal information. Uh, what if you believe you've been compromised? Uh, we've kind of talked about that, but you know, contact your credit bureaus, contact your, your credit card agencies, notify people, and definitely contact your supervisor and your um, um, IT staff. Um, even if you are compromised in your own personal life, it might be a good idea to, to notify your school district organization because the thing is, if you were compromised personally, what did they get access to that might give them an inroad to compromise the organization? So let someone know you've been compromised so that we can be aware that that's happened. Um, I think we already covered that slide. I may have just had that twice. Um, Tools of the trade. Uh, we talked about apps, online accounts. I do want to talk about online accounts. And you'll see, it, say, see that in the next slide, I believe. Uh, probably the next slide. But uh, be careful with online accounts. Um, be careful with the apps you install. Just because it's in the Apple App Store, just because it's in the Google Play Store or the Chrome Web Store, does not mean it's safe. It, it's important you know that. Um, it, you don't have to have a jailbroken phone to have your your device compromised. And don't think because you have an Apple phone that you are safe. And don't think because you have a Google phone you're safe. In fact, I, I would probably argue a little bit, and I, I have a Google phone, and I'm a very big, strong Google advocate, but I, I would probably... Uh, say that Apple phones are a little more secure, but don't believe the commercials that say that they are 100% uh, secure and they can't be hacked. Um, they just can't truly make those promises. And um, uh, hackers, it's the, it's a multi-billion dollar business to get into your phone. And so um, don't think that people aren't working every single day to find exploits to get into that Apple phone or that Google phone or that Chrome device. Um, so so be careful what you install and I would, I would encourage you to minimize the number of apps you install because um, many of the apps on both the Apple Store and the Google Store have been found to have crypto mining, key logging, or if nothing else, data transfer. What data are you transferring to these people and what are they doing with it? And so you gotta be aware of that. So this is a good example of data. Um, I created a website. Um, and then I built a database on that around that website. So I, this is all a fictional situation, but this is a real this is a real scenario I, I created to make it visible for y'all here. But let's say I create an educational resource website, and it's at michaelkeo.com. You can go there and you can get access to my incredible educational resources. But to do that, you have to create an account. And when you do that, I'm going to have legitimate articles. I'm going to have tools. I'm going to have strategies. Uh, it's going to be a good website. And I'm going to do a lot of research. I'm going to put a lot of effort into it. And you're going to love my website because I'm going to give you tools to revolutionize your classroom, right? But when you go there and you have to create that username and password, I got to collect that in a database, right? So, um, what is happening with that database? So ha have you read my privacy policy? Do I even have a privacy policy on my website? Do I have a terms of use? Do I tell you what I'm doing with your data and how I'm sharing it? If I don't have one, that would be your number one concern. Um, but secondly, be concerned if I'm not a big organization or somebody that's trusted and and, and they have a, uh, um, you know, a tried and true method of, of showing you their, their, their security practices. Um, because when you create your account, um, maybe in the background i'm not hiding your password so when i log into my database this is what i see so i see a database that says i got usernames i got first name last name and i got passwords well i put that in all, all in clear text 
Well, okay, I see some example.coms here. Let's assume those are Gmail accounts. Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is say, okay, I've collected 3,000 uh, usernames and passwords. Wonder how many usernames and passwords are going to uh, work with the Gmail account. So maybe Tina at example.com um, I'm going to go to example.com and I'm going to click on the email button that's on example.com and I'm going to try Tina at example.com and I'm going to try W at KIKI11 and see if it lets me in. Oh, it didn't let me in. Okay, well, let's try Facebook. Oh, yep, it let me into his face, the Facebook account. So now, now I have, I have, I have all the tools I need to compromise tons of your stuff because how many times, and, and y'all be honest with yourselves, how many times have you used the same password in multiple locations? And you know we all do it. Uh, I've done it, you've done it. And so now think about the fact of how, uh, who, uh, just mentally think who has the same G, uh, password for their Gmail as they do their Facebook. Well, you've just, you just opened yourself up to a multi-level compromise. Once somebody gets your Gmail account, they are in your Facebook account. And so um, be leery when you're creating accounts. I love to use the, the, um, the single sign-on through Facebook and Google. Um, I think the other services offer it, but the Facebook and Google are the primary ones offered right now. And what you do is you see that and you click on Facebook or you click or you click on the sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google and it takes you to a Google page. You want to make sure that the page that you went to actually belongs to Google. Otherwise, it's somebody trying to trick you. Um, and then log in with Google and then guess what? The person that you're signing in on, they never get your the, your information. They might get your email account, but they're never going to get your password because that's stored with Google and Google saying, yes, they are who they say they are. So this is an effort by Google and Facebook and others. Whether you like these companies or not, um, they are they're an effort by these companies to prevent this scenario where people are stealing your passwords because you're creating accounts. Um, long story short, I'm going to reiterate. Uh, be very, very leery when you go to a website and it asks you to register and you have to put in a username and a password. And if you have to do that, do something that you would not use anywhere else, like a um, maybe a, a, a test email or a, a, a new email account for just for junk or, or something you wouldn't use as your primary, and then use a password that is completely outside the scope of what you would use normally. Um, I know it's a pain, but that's also where things like LastPass come in because now you've segregated them and your email and your password will not match with anything else they're doing. Um, so that's a good thing. If you want to know if, you're, uh, if your web, or if you've been compromised, I think it's uh, haveibeenpwned.com and I think it's P-N-E-D, I think. So you, you might look at that, but uh, it's a good website to find. Uh, I think Know Before has, has some tools to, to help you see if your passwords or your user accounts have been compromised. Social media, the rest of this presentation is going to be pretty quick, so uh, we'll go through it pretty fast. But social media, uh, be courteous. Uh, don't share sensitive information ever on social media. Um, uh, it's never a good place to put that information. In fact, I would say lock down your social media so uh, some of your information is private. Think about the fact that you post a picture of your house. What can a hacker do with that? Well, they can probably get your address. They can see what's around you. They can see all kinds of stuff. Or what, what about if you're saying, hey, leaving to, to uh, Mexico next week and we're going to... Um, we're, we're looking forward to our, our vacation to Cancun or Europe or whatever. Uh, a hacker that's watching your account now knows that your house is vacant. And it's a great opportunity to go and rob you, uh, rob you or, or, steal your, or steal your stuff from your home. Um, so be very careful. What you post on Facebook is now public to the world. And if someone's watching you, uh, they, you, you could really put yourself in a world of hurt. There have been plenty of people that have posted that they were going to be out of town and their accounts are that their accounts, their, their world has been rocked because you know, they, they've had home theft or invasion or things like that. Um, let's keep on going. Uh, personal impact, you know, like we said, it may impact your employment. Uh, social network is not social at all. It's, uh, it, you know, be, We've gotten to a social culture where we've digitized ourselves so much. You know, encourage your kids to get out of social media. And, and you take be the example. Get out of social media a little bit and get outside and, and play and do things. And um, always a good thing. And I know it's not the scope of this this conversation, which is why I'm keeping the slides short. But it, we need to kind of pull away from some of the digital profiles we're creating and and do some stuff in real life. Sometimes I think. Uh, we talked about social engineering. They're professionals. They take their time and they collect data and they collect and collect and collect. And you would be shocked the databases that exist out there. Um, there's data. There's a database on you right now. And that know before and that uh, have I been pwned websites. They they collect these databases so they can tell you if you've been, been compromised. But uh, 
you know, th these databases exist. I guarantee you're on them. Um, but uh, you want to be aware of what compromise ha has Chase Bank been compromised? Well, you know, has, has Toys R Us, or I guess they're out of business, but um, be aware of what accounts you have and what companies have been compromised because that means you've been compromised. So here's those pictures I was talking about earlier. This probably should have been moved earlier up in the slide, but um, imagine if these were teachers. So they're, they're on social media, they're on Google. Um, according to Texas law and according to the agreement we sign as educators, you could be fired for this picture depending on your school district. And um, you know, there are people that are fired for pictures like this. But what if, you know, forget being fired. I mean, that's horrible, that's traumatic in your life. But what if your student signs onto your Facebook and they see this picture? Uh, what's it gonna be like when you go into class the next day? They may not say anything, but then you have this, this image and am I saying it's wrong to have a beer or a glass of wine? No, it's it's not. But this is now data you've put out there, and and in a way you've compromised yourself. So um, I would encourage you if you have pictures like this, or if you have pictures that you wouldn't want your students seeing, you know, go into your social media and start pulling that stuff off. Um, but start pulling stuff off that can identify you too. You you want to be aware of that kind of stuff. Okay, cyberbullying. Um, we're almost there. So. Um, Let's see. Uh, you know, the, the old thing, sticks and stones can break your bones. This is a this is an old idiom, but the truth is it doesn't exist anymore. Um, when things happen online, they happen uh, on a more permanent basis. Um, this slide was actually built a year and a half ago, but as of as of a year and a half ago, um, 44,000, uh, 4,400 suicides yearly were, were caused by social, social and cyber bullying. Um, we have got to take an effort as educators, as leaders in our communities to, um, to really inform our kids of the dangers, not only the, the, the dangers of what's going on, but you know, kids don't realize that what they put out there is, is dynamically affecting someone else's life. And, and the right thing posted could, has not only could, but has resulted in another person, um, ultimately taking their own life. Um, it's an epidemic and we, we've got to stop it. And so I, I think as educators, we have a, we have a responsibility to focus on this. Um, uh, we have to, you know, you go on Facebook a lot of times, and a lot of us are so burnt out on things like Facebook and social media because of sometimes it can get very toxic. But keep in mind, the words you say are just so lasting. And even as an adult, you get mad at someone for their, for their political viewpoint or their religious viewpoint, or just because you disagree with the way that they put the, the garden gnome in their lawn, um, and, and you're, you're going to chew them out about it on Facebook. And, and and you know really you're you're putting something out there that's just that's that's out there permanently now. Um, it it doesn't go away. So um, this is a quick thing on cyberbullying. It's also made by uh, um, Kapersky. Uh, I kind of just pulled a big old chunk of their stuff. I'm gonna let you watch this. Um, you can either watch it on my presentation here on the site, or you can go to Kapersky and you can watch it yourself. But it's ten forms of cyberbullying. I encourage you to watch it. It's a good video and uh, it's very informative. So, so I'm not gonna waste your time in this video for, so you can watch another video again. So. Uh, creative rights is our last slide. Uh, again, has nothing to do with digital security, but we need to make sure that we know that things that are online are not necessarily free for you to use. Um, if there's free fonts like defont.com, number one, be aware that sometimes these free things exist for uh, giving you viruses. So some, there's been a lot of viruses that have actually come through things like defont, um, where, you, where people are taking a, a, a font that was designed to, to be paid for and they're duplicating it and they're giving it to you for free. Well, nothing like that comes for free. So that maybe you're getting something else with it, right? Um, but on top of that, it's just the creative rights. You know, people build these, or take photographs and make pictures and things like this. Um, and, they, and they get posted online and you can download them and you can stick them on your stuff. But um, always use the Google's uh, rights of use uh, tool uh, because you don't know what if what you're using is actually legal for you to use unless you use that where it's been specified as a legal doc, legal for you to use for another purpose um, but also avoid them sometimes they're they, they can be dangerous okay that was a lot of information and uh, at this point you've completed the security or the internet uh, or information security training course um, at this point you can you can go back through the presentation on your own at learn.cisd.us um, and I'll actually pull that slide up here in just a second. But you can also download the free ebook. In fact, let me just take you there. Let me see where that is. Let's just go here. So we're going to go to learn.cisd.us. And from here, you'll find the Internet Information Security Training. Um, this video that we're doing is about to be posted right here, but here's the presentation. 
Um, you can download the free ebook right there. It's about 60 pages that goes much more in depth than what we did today. And you can also take the quiz here. If you take the quiz and you get 80% or higher, you're going to get the certificate that you can print and give to whoever in your organization needs it. If you don't make 80%, you can retake the exam until you get 80%. So uh, again, I hope this is informative and uh, thank you for taking us, uh, taking this course and choosing Canyon ISD to uh, provide this training for you. Have a great day.